Oh, good morning, everyone. It is uh, great to see you. I want to welcome our friends in Gallup uh, this morning. Uh, before I dive in, I do want to uh, say this one item this next Saturday uh, is our single mom oil change. Again, that started in Love Week, and we decided that, um, hey, this would probably be something that should be done uh, three or four times a year. So our aim right now is three. Uh, we need three to five more guys who are willing to help uh, with oil change. So uh, again, you can just go to the app uh, and sign up through that or uh, out in the gathering area. There's a couple iPads uh, that you can use to sign up. So last Sunday night, before I went to bed, um, had my phone and decided to, to hit Facebook and just kind of see what's happening in Facebook world. And one of the first posts that I saw uh, was from a young lady by the name of Hannah. Um, Hannah was a member of our last church in Missouri, and as I kind of scrolled through uh, her pictures that she was sharing, there was one picture that stopped me in my tracks. Uh, it was Hannah and her family, and her older sister, Rachel, and their mom and dad, Dan and Chris. I can't explain really what happened at that moment, but the, the feeling in my heart, the joy in my heart, the love in my heart when I saw that picture is something that I really cannot explain. Uh, from the time uh, we got, in, uh, got to M Missouri in 1997, I uh, had one child at the time, and Dan and Chris Pepper became like, surrogate family. In fact, their daughters, Hannah and Rachel, um, they used to babysit. In fact, the first time that Hannah and Rachel babysat, just our one child at the time, who was Zach, um, at the end of the night when Tara and I got home, uh, I offered to pay them, and they said, no, this one is on us. And I felt really, really bad, uh, but they kept asking to babysit. They kept volunteering, and after the second or third time of them not taking money, I kind of figured that maybe dad was behind it. So um, I, I gave them a little bit of money and I said, don't tell your dad. So the next Sunday at church, Dan pulled me aside. And he handed me the money that I had given his daughter's. And he said, and he's just a, like the, the most chill guy on the face of the planet. He said, let me explain how this works. My girls babysit for your family. And when you and Tara need a night out, we want to be the first people that you call. I'll settle up with them, but this is our ministry to your family. I could share moment after moment after moment with, about Dan and Chris Pepper. How awesome they are. In fact, a couple of years ago, I went back for a wedding, uh, did a, a wedding for uh, a young lady in our church that basically was a baby. Uh, the same time Libby was a baby, they have remained friends. And at that wedding, Dan told me that he still has a coloring page from Zach from Sunday school in his office. We sat around with Dan and Chris and a couple of our other friends, Casey and Becky and Alan and Lisa, and it was as if we never left. It was, it was just absolutely uh, amazing. In fact, when I think about Dan and Chris Pepper, they are more than friends. They are dear friends. Uh, they are friends that have a piece of our heart and vice versa. And the reason why that friendship was forged more than anything else is because of the church. And as I share this story about Dan and Chris, I could share stories about people in this room where there are the same kind of friendship. Friendships that come because we love Jesus and are committed to Jesus and simply 
come to the same church. So as I share this story, please understand, it's not an isolated story. It's not a unique story. In fact, as long as the church has been the church, there have been special friendships that have been forged out of a genuine and common love for Jesus. Maybe you could share stories just like that. But here's the interesting thing as we close out the book of 2 Peter here today. You see, four times throughout the, the last chapter of 2 Peter, Peter uses the same refrain, Dear friends. Your Bibles might say beloved friends. Dear friends. You see, Peter, as he is actually teaching some pretty tough stuff, he could have pulled out the apostolic authority card. He could have pulled out the like, listen, I'm your spiritual authority, do what I tell you to do. But Peter doesn't use the apostolic authority card, he uses the dear friends. It's a shared love for Jesus. And these people have a piece of his heart. And he cares for them. And he wants what is best for them. And so as he's giving his final instruction, instructions, he says, so, so dear friends. In fact, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 14 here this morning. And, and understand that Peter is speaking from a standpoint of love and affection for the people uh, of the churches that he is writing, people that he had shared time with, people that he had probably prayed with and cried with, and that they spent an uh, immense amount of times together. And he begins with this, And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless, in his sight. I want you to think about what he says here. While we are waiting, in fact, he's speaking to what uh, Jim spoke about last week, as as Peter wrote about the the certainty of the return of Jesus. And even though there were scoffers who were scoffingly scoffing at the fact that Jesus had not returned, Peter speaks to that certainty and says, "While we are waiting, and while we are waiting implies." Uh, that Peter's getting ready to tell them, okay, while we are waiting, this is what you need to do. This is how we wait on the return of Jesus. And it was true then, and I think what he says is, is true now. So while we are waiting, make every effort. Now, this is a favorite term in, uh, of Peter because in, in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, make every effort effort to take claim of the promises of God. Make every effort. In fact, so there is a part of our faith that we have to understand. Jesus does his part, right? But there is a part that is dependent upon us that we have responsibility as, as we are, are part of what this glorious body is called the church. And so as we wait for Christ's return, we are to make every effort. First, what we find, we make every uh, effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless. Make every effort to live peaceful lives. In fact, this is a little bit tough uh, because the original language just says make every effort to live at peace. It doesn't say what that peace is directed to. Now, I could go back and say that, uh, like it says in Colossians chapter 1, that through the, the cross of Jesus, he made peace between God and us. So the, the cross of Christ accomplished uh, a reconciliation and a peace with God that uh, has no longer been the case since the Garden of Eden, and, and Jesus granted us peace with God. So perhaps it is saying that we ought to do all that we can to live at peace with God, but there could be the fact that we are also called to live at peace in the world in which we live, that we are called to live at peace with people. And I, I think that there's something here, that as we seek 
to continue to live at peace with God, we will continue to seek to live at peace with people. So it's kind of like one of those things that it's uh, a vertical relationship with God, horizontal uh, with, with people. But I, I, I think about this command that, that Peter uh, gives the church. He says, you know, again, make every effort. Um, this, there's never a time that we're off the hook. Once we start, we continue, and we perpetually continue to make every effort to live at peace. In fact, uh, when I think about this, I think maybe we ought to consider 1 Timothy uh, in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. I urge you first of all to pray for all people, ask God for help uh, to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godly, godliness and dignity. So, um, here's something interesting that Paul writes, and it's not the first time that he would write something in this regard, about the nature to live, or the call to live at peace with people around us. Now, uh, over the last several weeks, uh, and, and I've told people I will get around to it when I get around to it, but I, I've had a, a, a number of texts that said, um, are you going to encourage people to vote this election year? And I said, of course. In fact, I got a text yesterday. I said, it will actually come uh, tomorrow. I will actually say something. So I'm going to say, absolutely vote. There's actually a statistic that has come out that only 30% of Christians actually voted in the last presidential election. And, and I think that's a low number. But I also think about what we're called to, to do as Christians regardless of whom is in office, right? Regardless of the kings and the authorities that govern us, we are called to pray for them. And one of the results of, of, of that should happen when we pray for our kings, when we pray for our presidents and our governors, is what? That we can live peaceful and quiet lives in the world in which we are in. So here's one of the things I would like to throw out. 30% of Christians voted in the last election, and we gasp. Imagine the power that would happen if our desire was so much to live at peace in the world in which we lived in that even 30% of Christians prayed for those in government. Maybe... Maybe the profound change in our world and our culture comes through that. So we, we, we seek to live at peace. We're making every effort to do this, but we're also making every effort uh, to, to be pure and blameless um, in his sight, in Jesus' sight. And, and so when we think about this, the, um, the false teachers in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 were called a disgrace and a stain, a, a blemish and a blot. That's what they did, and that's who they were, and that was against the work of Jesus. But here we are called to be pure and blameless. We are called to reflect not the character of the world around us, but the character uh, of Jesus. And even though Jesus accomplished the work that made us pure and blameless, again, we are making every effort, as far as it depends upon us, to live that godly life. And so I would say that maybe Peter is saying it like this, Work hard to be right with God and with people. And as we wait for Jesus' return, we seek to be right with God, right with God, and right with our fellow man. And this is not complex. It's not necessarily easy, but this is not complex because one of the things that countless churches do today, we all have our little uh, our statements, our, our little slogans and different things like that. A number of churches say, love God, love people. And, and so as we wait, as we wait for Jesus, we simply love God. That's a thing that we should do. We should seek to, to please God, but also live right with our fellow man. But as Peter goes on, uh, it's, it's interesting that he draws us back again to the second coming of Christ. He, he brings this up, and remember. 
And, and so basically, he is wanting us to remember something specific. And the idea is when we remember something and there's a constant remembering that's going on, it will transform our minds. And remember the Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother, our dear brother, again, there's the familial aspect here. Uh, Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. So with this, uh, we remember the second coming of Jesus, but we also remember God's patience. We remember that ultimately God wants to give people time to be saved. And then he writes about Paul. Writes about the, the Apostle Paul. So uh, one of the things that's interesting is it's not like um, that, that Paul and, and, and Peter didn't ever cross paths. That actually, they, they probably at different times ministered to the same churches. And so Peter's almost like saying, I'm telling you the same thing Paul probably told you in person and what Paul has, has told you uh, in his writings. In fact, let's go to verse 16. Uh, in verse 16, we find something interesting about Paul. He says, speaking of these things in, in, in all of his letters, so he wrote to you, he, he was speaking of all these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do other parts of Scripture. And this will result in their destruction. So I, I think it's rather interesting, kind of what, what, what Peter brings up about Paul, a couple of interesting aspects. Now we are 30, maybe 35 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And I think that's important for us to, to kind of uh, lock into. But here's something to think about. He said some of Paul's writings are difficult to understand. And I'll go as far as to say that most Scripture is very easy to understand, but there are parts of Scripture that are very difficult. And it is sometimes those very difficult aspects of Scripture that false teachers like to kind of gravitate to and grab a hold of and say, I know what no one else knows about this. So difficult passages of Scripture are like fodder for false teachers. Now, uh, just go ahead and tell you, we're closing up uh, 1 Peter today, and uh, we're going to start in the book of Daniel uh, next week. In fact, Jesus uh, on the night that he was betrayed in John chapter 17, he prayed for the church. He prayed for the church not to be taken out of the world, but to live in the world. So we're going to look at the book of Daniel with the question of what does it look like to live in the world in which we are in today? Now, if you know anything about the book of Daniel, uh, there are like six chapters that are like narrative, and it's easy, and it's good, and you get to chapter 7, you get to chapter 8, and you get on and on and on. There's a lot of stuff in there that, like, it stopped Daniel in his tracks. He was white with fear. He did not understand. And I, I will tell you what is interesting to me when you study those passages from, like, uh, like biblical commentaries. Biblical commentaries, like Bible scholars, are really careful to say this could mean this, and this could mean this, and it could mean this, and these are uh, ultimately speaking of end times sort of things. But there are many who will say, this is what it means, and this is what it means, and here's the timeline, and here's this, and here's this, and here's this, and they may be right. But sometimes, maybe the best course of action in something we don't understand is not try to explain it. And, be, and, and basically say there are parts of the Bible are hard to understand. And so these men took what Paul was writing, and some of those difficult areas, they were twisting and manipulating and using it for their own benefit. But again, Peter uses the term that they were twisting the words of Paul <clears throat> 
as they do other parts of Scripture. And so the implication here is this. 30, 35 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the church had already begun to develop the idea of what was Scripture, what was inspired of God, Paul's letters, what was not. And Paul's words were to be considered to be Bible as we would today. So as he kind of talks about that, kind of chases that little rabbit, I just want to say this, again, uh, echoing what Jim stated last week. God is patient in the second coming because he wants people to know Jesus. Talked about a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Why is God tearing? Well, why is God waiting? Because he wants people to know Jesus. His heart is that none should be, should be lost, that all would come to repentance. That's ultimately God's desire. And so one of the things I just want to drop here and, and let you chew on here for a moment, God's patience is no excuse for our inaction. Folks, there are people all around us in our community and our state. New Mexico is one of the least uh, churched states in the United States. Uh, the United States is considered to be post-Christian, which means that there are a whole lot more people that kind of fit into the category of no religion at all than, than, than Christianity. There are a lot of people that need to know Jesus. And so I, I mentioned the, the statistic 30%. 30% of people um, voted, uh, as far as Christians, voted in the last election. I think that's a low number, and so I encourage you to vote. Imagine what would happen in our world if 30% of Christians invited people to church. Think about what happened if 30% of Christians were actively sharing the message of Jesus with their friends and their neighbors and their family members and their coworkers, That would change the world as we know it. So now Peter goes back again to dear friends. Final words. I, I am warning you ahead of time, dear friends. In fact, that kind of the idea is I'm not telling you anything new. But he says this, Be on guard so that you will not be carried away by errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. So be on your guard. Literally, uh, this is a command. It's not an option. You don't get to set this one out. There's never a time that you should not be on your guard. So be on your guard so that you are not snatched away. And, and here's the, the idea about the continual uh, action. Uh, I, I kind of think about life through the lens of sports and movie quotes. In fact, my family tells me um, every time I share a movie quote in a sermon, they will say, Dad, you got it wrong. So I paraphrase movie quotes. And, but I filter life through sports. And so the idea of being on your guard, right, uh, it kind of goes back to what Paul wrote in, in Ephesians chapter 6, that your feet are fitted with readiness. In other words, uh, in, in sports, this would be the defensive position. In fact, uh, in, in football, I remember we used to go, ready, ready. And so on defense, our feet were ready, our our body was, uh, was ready, and I, I think about in, in baseball, because I, I actually did okay in baseball, but if you're playing uh, in baseball, whether you're in the outfield, outfield or infield, a, as the pitcher is on the mound, and you know that he is getting ready to pitch, what do you do? You get in the ready position, you bend your knees, you, know, you do all of that, and I, I I'll tell you, if you're ever flat-footed, it can be disastrous. In fact, I, I think about when I was in high school. It was between my sophomore and junior year of high school. 
uh, I was on the all-star team for our league. So the state tournament just happened to be uh, in Dodge City. So there was teams from all throughout uh, the state. Uh, all the different all-star teams made it into uh, to this area. And I, I remember we played our first game at like, um, oh, I don't know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, second game was kind of mid-afternoon. And then our last game was supposed to be at 10 o'clock. But of course, all of the games ran over. So it was about midnight when we started playing. So first game, 8 o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and, and last game, like at midnight. I am toast by that point in time. It's July, it's hot, it's humid, it's Kansas. And, and so I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I, I was out in left field, literally out in left field. Uh, usually played first base, but uh, the, the other guy on the team was first base, but was really slow, and I was pretty fast. So they put me out in left field. And again, long day, uh, fog is beginning to set in, and I am out in la-la land. I'm out in la-la land, and I know that I'm not paying attention, and I am not ready. And all of a sudden, and those of you who know, you know, you hear the metal of the bat hit the ball. And I cannot tell you how many thoughts went through my mind as soon as, as, soon as I heard that, that, that bat hit the ball. And I went, huh, let me hit the ball. I wonder where he hit it. You know, kind of that whole thing. And I look up, and, and out of the fog comes the ball to left field. And I'm thinking, I better go catch it, right? So let me tell you what happened, because I was not in the defensive ready position. I went and I, I, I tried to catch it and it went behind me and our team lost and we were eliminated from the tournament. That's actually not what happened. Um, miraculously, I caught the ball. Okay? Our team still lost and we were eliminated from the tournament. But I remember from the stands hearing my dad say this, yell this, hey, wake up out there. I wasn't ready. And by the grace of God, I didn't let my team down. But when it comes to our spiritual lives, We can't play flat-footed. we got to constantly be on guard because there is an enemy and the enemy influences evil people and evil people become tools of the enemy to push us off the foundation of Jesus. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, we're not, we're not playing tiddlywinks here. This is not a game. And so one of the things that we have to understand is you, we all together, are a soft target for the enemy if we're not constantly on guard. We never get to sit this one out because Scripture tells us that there is an enemy and he is like a prowling lion waiting for somebody to be off guard, looking for someone to devour. Now, our final verse. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Here's another command. Grow. Uh, again, we don't get to set this one out. There must be continual growth in our life. Those of you who are parents, there's a certain phase of growing your kids or raising your kids where growth is expected, physical growth is expected. And if physical growth does not happen, you know something is drastically wrong. And so as Christians... We are commanded to grow. We are commanded to grow first in grace. The, uh, the grace of God is God not treating us as our sins deserve. 
uh, because of Jesus' death and, uh, and his sacrifice on the sin that paid for our sins, when we come to a relationship with Jesus, when we come to faith in Jesus, we receive God's grace where God says, I am not going to treat you as your sins deserve. Ultimately, one of the things that we find that when God forgives our sins, when he does not treat us as our sins deserve, it says in Scripture that he remembers our sins no more. And, and so God in his infinite wisdom and grace knows how to not remember our sins. I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to do that. But God has the ability to wipe them out of his memory forever. And so we are called to grow in grace, grow in our knowledge of grace, embracing what the free gift of grace is in our walk for Jesus. And I'll explain why that is important here in just a few moments. But also that we have uh, growth in our knowledge of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that I love is the, the, the third chapter of Philippians. Paul is dealing with false teachers in the church who were telling uh, the, these new believers, non-Jewish believers, that if you really want to believe in Jesus, if you really want to be a Christian, you must become Jewish first and then follow Jesus. So they were adding things on to grace. It was like it's Jesus plus all this other stuff over here before you can reach that place that you are right with God. And basically, Paul says, listen, I could make it about my spiritual resume. I could tell you all the things that I've done, but I simply want to know Jesus. In fact, he might have used some very crass language where he says, I consider everything rubbish for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That is like, I, and, and so what Peter is saying here is more than anything, not, not just growing in grace, but growing in your knowledge of Jesus. And here's why this is important. First of all, the idea of grace. False teachers, their main tool is to either deny altogether or redefine what grace is. So why should we continue to just lock into grace and hold on to grace? Understand, for it is by grace that we have been saved, right? Not our good works, not our awesomeness, so that no one can boast. And so what, what false teachers seek to do is, again, they either eliminate the possibility of grace or they define it to where grace is drained of its meaning and its value. And knowing Jesus... Here's the deal. You know what they've said about married couples? The more a couple is together and married, the more they become like one another. Why is that? Shared life. The more you walk with someone and live with someone and journey life together, you're going to start becoming one as far as who you are. And why do we seek to grow in our knowledge of Jesus? Because the longer we walk with Jesus, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we seek to know Jesus, the more we're going to look like him. So Peter has kind of th thrown down the gauntlet. But I just want to kind of put it together as far as what Peter has called us to do. And this is our bottom line here for today. While we wait for Jesus' return, we are to make every effort to grow in our understanding of grace and our knowledge of Jesus. We embrace the idea that there is a personal responsibility in our walk and our journey with Jesus, and we seek to live at peace, and we work hard to, to look like God and look like Jesus we seek to remember the fact that there's going to be a day that there's not going to be more, any more days like today. And Jesus is going to return and he is going to make all things new. And the dwelling of, of God is with man. And there's just this amazing thing that is in the future. But until that time, here's what we do. And this is our head, heart, and hands this morning. Continually grow in your knowledge of Jesus. And if I could, 
if I could just be as practical as I possibly could here. Much of this de is dependent upon God's word and how much you are in God's word in your life. And so I always challenge people to develop some kind of rhythm, some kind of rhythm that works for you so that you are daily or almost daily uh, in God's word in some fashion, some form, some kind, uh, in that constant sort of thing. So really seeking to grow in your knowledge of Jesus. It's not checking a box. Uh, it's investing your life, and I just want to know who Jesus is. Uh, as far as the heart is concerned, continually grow in your knowledge of grace. I think most of us, given our own whims and desires, uh, want to make salvation a Jesus plus me sort of thing. That, you know, we, we, we understand that it's by grace that we have been saved, right? But we also say, man, I really want, I want to do something that's going to tip the scales in my favor. Uh, I want to do something that, uh, that, like God is like, hey, uh, you and Jesus really did that great thing in that salvation thing. But growing in our knowledge of grace is an understanding of, of my own, of my own sinfulness, of my own depravity. And that is only because of what Jesus has done that has gotten me anywhere in right standing with God. And finally, this. Be on guard constantly. Jim and I have talked about being a husband before. Sorry to burst your bubble, husbands. As husbands, we don't get a day off. We're constantly be the one who sacrifices and loves our wife and our family. When we're walking with Jesus, listen, we don't get to sit a day out. We don't, we, that, that's, that is a surefire way that the enemy will attack. So ultimately, we seek to constantly be on guard for the arrows and the weapons of the enemy who is Satan. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, I thank you that you have made a path possible that we might know you through knowing your son. And so let that be a constant striving and desire in our life. God, thank you. Thank you um, for your grace that saves us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.